Hello, it's Scott Manley here. When Vanguard 1 launched in 1958, its second stage was propelled by an AJ-10-37 rocket engine. When Orion launched around the moon last year, the service module used an AJ-10-190 engine to push it into that distant retrograde orbit. And right away, I need to be clear that these are not the same engine, but they are part of a large family of engine with some level of commonality they've evolved over the years. The main thing they have in common is they are pressure-fed engines and they are built by Aerojet, or more recently, Aerojet Rocketdyne, or actually L3 Harris Aerojet Rocketdyne. But point is, yeah, these engines have an immensely long history. And, you know, this goes back to the very earliest days of rockets. So Aerojet was formed in the 1940s by the likes of Theodore von Karman and Jack Parsons, of course, of JPL fame, and a number of other luminaries of rockets. And their first product was a small thousand pound solid rocket motor that was designed to help planes take off using less runway, right? So-called JATO systems, Jet Assisted Takeoff. Now, as far as I can tell, the first liquid-fueled engines that Aerojet produced in quantity were for the Nike missile. And, and those were, at some point, they were adapted to the second stage of the AeroB sounding rockets. And that's the first place I see in documentation a mention of an AJ-10 engine. The designation for these were the AJ-10-24 and 25. These were burning aniline and uh, fuming nitric acid. And I honestly have no idea how we got up to number 24, if there were 23 previous ones or if there was some internal coding system or whatever. There's also AJ-11 engines, which are also pressure-fed engines. But for engines on orbital class rockets, we have to go to Vanguard. And that was the work of the US Naval Research Laboratory which uh, began development of Vanguard in 1955. The actual construction was contracted to the Glen L. Martin company, and then they competed for, or they, they had uh, companies compete for the second stage engine. One was Bell Aircraft, who produced a nice, simple, pressure-fed engine, and Aerojet, who proposed a much more higher performing, but more complex, turbopump-fed engine. And initially, Bell won. But Aerojet asked to submit their own pressure-fed engine, and they, in the end, they won the contract. But uh, during Vanguard development, they actually kept saying, why are you spending all this mass budget on these big, heavy propellant tanks when you could be using our nice, uh, you know, turbo pump uh, rocket? So anyway, yeah, the resulting engine for this was the AJ-1030. That used uh, UDMH, uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, as its propellant, and a white fuming nitric acid as the oxidizer. It would generate about four and a half tons of thrust. And this was early days. Vanguard was not the most successful rocket. It only achieved orbit three times out of its 11 attempts. And three of the seven fa or eight failures were due to that second stage engine. So thank goodness they didn't make it any more complex. As I said, the AJ-10 is a pressure-fed engine, which means that the pressure in the tanks is what drives the propellants into the combustion chamber. And this makes for a very simple rocket engine. But in return, you have to have much stronger propellant tanks to hold the pressure pressurized fuel. And it limits the pressure in the combustion chamber to below the pressure inside the tanks. And lower pressure in the combustion chamber means lower engine performance in terms of both thrust and specific impulse. For comparison, SpaceX's high, you know, much vaunted Raptor engine exceeds 300 atmospheres of pressure inside that combustion chamber, while the AJ-10 on the Vanguard barely makes seven atmospheres. So for these large rocket stages, they're usually set up that the tanks are full of fuel and then there's pressurized gas stored in high pressure cylinders, which will get delivered into the propellant tanks via pressure regulator to make sure the atmosphere or the gas doesn't get too high, the pressure doesn't get too high. Now, you'll also find blowdown systems in smaller spacecraft where you just have, say, two thirds of the tank full of propellant and the top full of high pressure gas, and that just expands over time. So because you have a change in the pressure feeding the engines over time, you'll have a change in performance, which needs to be accounted for when you're you know, calculating those burns. Of course, it makes for a, a simpler engine, but a more complex management of this, uh, you know, of your maneuvers.
While Vanguard didn't last long as a rocket, the engine itself would go on to fly on the Thor, which would later become the Delta. Initially, this started out with the Thor Abel, which took the two upper stages from the Vanguard and put them on top of a Thor rocket. For this, the engine designation was now the AJ-1040, and over time you had the AJ-1041 and the 42, and there was also like a Thor Abel, where the second stage was referred to as an AJ-10-101A. And the performance numbers didn't change very much. I think that, I don't really understand the numbering sequence, but I think what we're seeing here is slightly different fit, slightly different interfaces, small changes, while broadly the performance uh, capabilities are roughly the same. The AJ-10 also flew on the Atlas in the form of the Atlas Able. Uh, so this was uh, the AJ-10-101A, and this was basically the same thing as Thor Able, where you took the top two stages of Vanguard, but you put them on an Atlas instead, a bigger rocket. And this was not successful. The attempt to launch it four times, all four times were failures. One didn't even get through a static test fire. Uh, the whole thing was put out of its misery, which is a good thing because it was one of the ugliest rockets in history as far as I'm concerned. Now, back on Thor, they came up with the Thor Able Star, which basically expands the tanks on the second stage. You can watch my whole history of the Delta rocket, but importantly, the, the engine becomes the 10104, and uh, there was also the Thor Delta again with a slightly bigger second stage, and that became the AJ 10142. But all of these are essentially the same performance figures as the original Vanguard engine. But it would be the Thor Delta A which introduced the AJ-10-118. And this was the moment where they clearly decided that they weren't going to pick any new numbers because they started to iterate on this engine and instead of incrementing the number, they added a letter after each one. So we go through the A, B, C, D, and we get up to the AJ-10-118E in 1965. There have only been small incremental changes. It's still burning the same propellant, the UDMH and the nitric acid. That this would be the last of those incremental changes because the AJ-10 was going to be adapted for a new propellant for another rocket. The Titan III needed an upper stage capable of putting satellites into geostationary orbit, and this came in the form of the trans stage. The Titan III used a propellant called Aerozine 50, and that's a 50-50 mix of hydrazine and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. You see. Regular hydrazine gets much better performance in terms of specific impulse than UDMH, but it doesn't have great thermal properties. So aerozine 50 is a mix of 50% hydrazine and 50% UDMH. And this isn't as simple as you think, right? You can't just pour two batches of them together and stir. They actually had to come up with a special like atomizing uh, nozzle system that would spray it out into very, very fine drops, which would be incredibly toxic and dangerous. But they had to make these tiny drops so that they could mix it and not have it separate out while sitting around. So yeah, this got the better performance and allowed them to put more propellant into the the Titan rocket than they would otherwise be able to if they were using another propellant. And so they needed to generate and build an AJ-10 engine that could use this. And so they came up with the AJ-10-138. This was adapted to work with this propellant and still roughly the same performance. So they used two of these engines on the trans stage. This would fly first in like 1964 and it would then continue flying for the next 25 or so years, with the final launch being a Titan 34D in 1989, carrying a, you know, military communication satellites into higher orbits. Now, importantly, that same Aerozine 50 stuff would also be selected for the AJ-10-137, which is better known as the service propulsion system for the Apollo spacecraft. And this engine is a huge departure from the previous engines that I've mentioned. This had almost three times the thrust, about 10 tons. It had a huge nozzle extension, four meters long. The service propulsion system on Apollo was designed with the original direct ascent lunar mission in mind. That would mean they would have a very large spacecraft landing on the moon rather than just a light lander. And that meant that it would have needed a lot of thrust to lift off, hence the 10-ton thrust. This engine, of course, had to be supremely reliable. 
or otherwise it could leave the astronaut stranded on the surface of the moon or in low lunar orbit. It always had to start on command and it had to stop on command. The valves for this, there were four valves, two of them connected in series and parallel so that, you know, you could always guarantee that with one valve failure, you could still open and close the valves so that you could turn the engine on and off. And of course, this arrangement was also needed for both the fuel and the oxidizer system. Like the engine had dual helium pressurization system with redundant tanks and pressure regulators to make sure there was no single point of failure on this single point of failure. The huge nozzle extension was made of niobium near the hottest part of the exhaust and as it got further down and things cooled it switched over to titanium. Developing the nozzle was a complicated method. You know, Determining the method to shape the sections and welding them into a single unit was quite a complicated problem which at one point involved some guy that was better known for building boats in Maine. So now we can come back to the Delta. When we last left it, it was burning UDMH and nitric acid, but in 1972 the second stage got a makeover and switched over to Aerosene 50 and nitrogen tetroxide, and the new AJ10-118F engine had four and a half tons of thrust, a big step up over the previous three and a half ton engine. The performance, the specific impulse, was about 15% better than the original AJ10, right? Now, that would work for a while. There would, did actually switch over to another engine called the TR-201 for a while. But when Delta II was developed in the late 80s, it flew with the AJ-10-118K and it continued to fly with that right up to the final launch a few years ago. Finally, the last important version of this engine was developed for the Space Shuttle. Right, for the orbital maneuvering system, this was the AJ-10-190 and again they switched propellant to um, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. So monomethyl hydrazine is more dense and slightly better performing than UDMH or Aerosene 50. The shuttle engines themselves were actually built slightly smaller, they only have about 2.7 tonnes of thrust, but they, again they were really reliable, they were in these ohms pods on the side, uh, you know, near the tail section. They had about a thousand feet performance delta V capability. These engines would be used for major adjustments in the or orbit. Say they were rendezvousing with another spacecraft or traveling from a one orbit to another or just deorbiting the space shuttle. These would do all of that. And these engines have literally been taken off the space shuttle because the pods, the ohms pods could actually be swapped out. So they've taken these engines, they've refurbished them, and these engines are the ones that are actually flying on the service module, which is built by Europe. There are American engines that flew on the space shuttle, but they've cleaned them up and they're sending them over to Europe to use for the service module on the Orion. They built, or they've supplied six of these, and uh, Europe is gonna go through those for Orion one through six. And after that, Aerojet Rocketdyne has been given the contract to build the replacement engine. It's currently and officially called the Orion main engine, but I expect it will be a modernized copy of the AJ-10-190. Main difference will be that you know, these engines were designed 50 years ago and manufacturing techniques have changed a whole lot in the meantime. So I expect we're going to see some 3D printed parts and uh, different formation systems used for the nozzle sections, but the AJ-10 will probably continue to live on in spirit. And that is, you know, continuing this incredibly long career of this engine. And, and the reason why it has such a long career is because it is a simple, reliable engine which still fits this niche. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.